To be a stormtrooper means perfection at all times, for you are the faceless enforcers of our Emperor's will, the might of Vader's fist. And so no matter what planet you are deployed to, what kind of filthy environment you have to wade through, no matter how much alien blood is spilled onto your gloves, at the end of the day, when your patrol is done, you must look perfect once again. From your white polished helm down to your unscuffed plastoid boots. For the enemies of the Empire never sleep, and tomorrow brings new horrors for you to overcome. And while most of you will never foresee your last day amongst the living, keeping your armor clean and in top shape guarantees that when you do go, you will not disgrace the mighty Galactic Empire. Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech, my name is Alan. And today we're going to take a look at some of the most horrifying secrets the Empire doesn't want you guys to know about. These are the details that they leave out of the recruitment brochures because they're so horrific that even the most fanatic cadets will be shaken in their resolve to join the Corps. And so today we present to you 10 of the worst deaths ever suffered by a stormtrooper. We did a similar video about clone trooper deaths in the past, and even though these individuals are identical copies of one another born in vats, they still had their own individual names and personalities. Perhaps it's the sameness of their appearance that forces the clones to adopt more of an individual identity. Or maybe it's their Jedi commanders that encourage them to embrace their differences. But for the stormtroopers, it's almost the other way around. It's as if the Emperor wanted to take all of these unique humans who had different hair color, body types, and heights and standardize them. This is so that no individual can stand out from the Imperial military. No single soldier can claim glory for himself. And so unfortunately, many of the individuals who died gruesome deaths on this list will go unnamed and will only be remembered by the terrible ways they died. Because ultimately, these men and women were just interchangeable cogs in the larger Imperial machine. During what was supposed to be a routine foot patrol through Jeddah City, guarding a shipment of kyber crystals, a unit of stormtroopers were ambushed by multiple partisan insurgents using detonators and blasters. The result was chaotic and several stormtroopers were gunned down before they could even locate their attackers. Luckily, a quick reaction force arrives on scene shortly after to chase away the terrorists and arrest those who remain behind. But as one squad tries to detain an odd blind man, he begins to use some kind of echolocation magic to dodge the blaster bolts. One poor trooper is taken by the blind man and used as a body shield. He instantly takes multiple shots at point blank range from his idiot fellow trooper. This is what happens when you don't allow your troopers to fraternize with each other and you also encourage them to rat each other out for misconduct. There's basically no unit cohesion at all. And suddenly you stop seeing the other individuals in your unit as a part of your team or even as human beings and suddenly there are more friendly fire incidents like this one and you're shooting your colleague in the balls twice wait let's rewind this and break down everything it's your foot, all right. first the stormtrooper shoots the ground and misses because he's a stormtrooper then he shoots twice center mass into his friend and realizes he needs to readjust he needs more stability so he goes down onto a knee and then shoots him in the nuts. And oh wait, it's, it's not actually twice, he shoots him three times. It's actually a really nice, tight grouping. The poor bastard then gets shot several more times. There's the sixth time, the seventh, the eighth, and the ninth. Pretty sure one of those shots hits him in the neck or the face. And then finally, the blind guy saves the stormtrooper by kicking the individual who keeps shooting at him. At which point, a second stormtrooper shoots him in the chest. That's 10 friendly fire shots on target, by the way, if you're still counting. It's at this point that Donnie Yen finally smacks the poor stormtrooper in the face with his stick, which is completely unnecessary because this guy clearly died already while he was still being used as a shield. Probably around shot three and five. Our next trooper is an Imperial Remnant Trooper. Basically, imagine being a stormtrooper, but with no logistical support and no military infrastructure to surround you. At best, these individuals are like hired guns, at worst, bandits. Discipline was poor, morale was low, and a lot of the gear and equipment and vehicles they were used to having were gone as well. To make matters worse, the individual that the troopers on Navarro run into is a full-blown Mandalorian. 
There are very few things worse than facing a Mandalorian, especially Death Watch Mandos. These crazy cultists never take their helmets off and have enough firepower to equip a heavy weapons platoon with just the stuff on their armor. To make matters worse, this is a highly stressed Mandalorian holding his little green baby child, so he's going to be doing his best to make sure they both get out of there alive. That means no holding back. Some of the Stormtroopers are lucky. They get to go down quickly. One gets electrocuted, a few get shot. Some get blown up by the whistling birds. I mean, you don't even hear these things coming. So it's a relatively painless death. What you don't want to be is the poor bastard who gets the flamethrower to the face. See, these plastoid helmets are really good at absorbing energy, but when exposed to high temperatures, they usually melt. So what essentially is happening here is that the plaster from his armor becomes liquid and then melts into his face, which of course causes gruesome and painful injuries to his flesh. Now, this stormtrooper most likely did not die then and there. He probably just collapsed from the shock and pain. But given the lack of resources the Imperial Remnant had, especially when it came to high-end medical equipment or even Bacta, I can imagine this guy's death will be slow, extremely painful, and full of infections and all sorts of other nasty things. This is why flamethrowers are probably one of the most messed up weapons you can use on another human being. This is why in our own real world, throughout the history of human warfare, individuals who were found operating this crazy weapon were oftentimes executed immediately by their opponents. When a mysterious bioweapon breaks containment on board the ISD Vector, TK-329 didn't understand what was happening until it was too late. At first, the medical bay started filling up with way too many individuals for this to be a normal disease. And then those patients expired, and then they rose from the dead, and then they started eating everything around them, including human beings. In our universe, we call this a zombie plague. In the Empire, it's known as the Black Wing Virus. TK-329 was capable enough to escape the initial surge of zombies and attempted to escape with his commander, Gorister. But as he tries to make his way towards the hangar, he feels the virus slowly taking over. TK-329 manages to send a message to his wife and kids before the virus takes complete control. He might be one of the luckier ones here though, because Commander Gorster and a few other officers get trapped inside of a shuttle, which is inside of the Vector's main hangar, and they get surrounded by zombies. When they run out of food, they have to resort to cannibalism. It's pretty terrible. None of them really make it out alive. Scout troopers were specialist stormtroopers trained in reconnaissance, marksmanship, and they liked to ride around on those really, really fast speeder bikes. During the Battle of Endor, a group of scout troopers spotted a small rebel pathfinder unit and attempted to escape in order to report their findings to the rest of their units. The rebels managed to knock out most of the scout troopers one by one, but the most brutal death occurs when Luke Skywalker tosses a scout trooper into a tree while flying at a ridiculously high speed. Why is this death worse than the other scout troopers who died in a massive fiery explosion when their uh, speeder bike ran into a tree or something like that? Well, that's because when the scout trooper hits the tree, the force is powerful enough to probably break his back but not kill him outright. This means he was probably paralyzed and then slowly died from exposure or, I don't know, dehydration or maybe some Ewok ran along and ate him alive. Either way, terrible way to go. Beskar, when combined with the right alloys, is one of the most durable metals in the entire galaxy. It's really the secret to the Mandalorian's success in combat because how could you be anything else but successful in combat when your armor is literally indestructible? And so you can imagine just how hot a Mandalorian forge needs to be in order to melt down this type of ore to work it. Those flames are white and blue for a reason. It's probably close to 3000 Fahrenheit in that forge, if not more. And so when five Imperial Remnant stormtroopers on Navarro managed to trap a Mandalorian armor around her forge, they should have realized that this is what we call in the gaming industry an interactive environmental hazard. So the armor goes into beast mode, immediately starts knocking heads off, and one of the troopers gets launched headfirst into her forge. This is probably a much quicker death than the flamethrower death, but it's probably a lot more painful in a much more limited time. It's probably also going to degrade the overall quality of Biscar coming out of that forge. You guys all know about the fearsome Ewoks of the Forest Moon of Endor. They might look soft, adorable, and delicious, but were actually ferocious nighttime hunters that were made out of extremely dense muscle. 
The 501st had no clue about these terrifying little teddy bears, and so when they first deployed, these innocent and naive troopers actually slept outside in the open. Now, one trooper known as Kovacs was on the first watch for his squad. The moment the rest of his unit fell asleep, a noose fell around his neck and dragged him up into the trees. The sheer strength of the Ewoks combined with the rope most likely snapped his neck, or not. But what we do know is that bits and pieces of Kovac were later found, and he turned out to be one of the first stormtroopers to be eaten by one of these terrifying little monsters. In the days that followed, the Ewok menace would grow in boldness, and soon during the night, it was no longer safe to venture outside of an Imperial base. Weeks later, the Ewoks had become bold enough to attack during the daytime. It's one thing to watch your comrades get taken out by detonators and blasters. It's a whole nother PTSD experience to see your fellow soldiers getting eaten alive by Ewoks. When Sabine Wren found out that the Empire had stolen her arc pulse generator invention and tuned it to destroy Beskar and those who wore it, she was furious. Mandalorian Iron long protected her people from all sorts of injury, and now her own work was leading to the deaths of dozens of Mandalorians, who were essentially cooked alive in their own armor. With the help of her rebel friend, Sabine managed to recapture her machine. She would retune it this time to destroy the plastoid armor worn by Imperial stormtroopers. Sabine was originally bent on killing all of the troopers who had corrupted her work, but she was ultimately convinced by fellow Mandalorian Bo-Katan to stop her murderous behavior and just let the stormtroopers live. Which is all nice and everything, but I feel like she had done enough damage by this point where, like, there was no going back. And this is why this Imperial combat driver suffered a terrible death. First, he was hit by the arc pulse generator beam, which is extremely painful. And then hot molten metal from the generator fell on top of his walker and most likely burnt through its hole and most likely severely burnt him. And finally, the Star Destroyer that his walker was parked in blows up and goes crashing towards the ground. And so, Sabine Wren's gesture of blowing up the Arc Pulse Generator is actually relatively empty. I don't know if they have Looney Tunes in the Empire, but this next Stormtrooper definitely never saw it. While fighting a group of criminal bounty hunters on the world of Tython, one stormtrooper who was manning a portable E-Web heavy blaster manages to pin down one of the expert marksmen firing onto his unit. The expert killer was none other than elite assassin Fennec Shan. She had killed more than most and therefore was able to quickly come up with a plan. She dislodges a gigantic boulder from the high ground and begins to roll it in the direction of the E-Web blaster position. Our heroic heavy weapon specialist stands his ground and tries to split the gigantic boulder with his weapon, which has now begun to crush his fellow squaddies. But unfortunately, in this case, E-Web does not beat rock. And the trooper's body is thoroughly crushed by this massive object. Lothal was considered a minor imperial holding. It was a low population, mineral rich world that had a relatively small and localized rebel cell operating on it. Governor Price and her stormtroopers were on their way to destroy one of these rebel cells when her men ran into three gigantic wolves. The problem with training a standard infantry unit in a galaxy like Star Wars is that you can't really prepare them for everything, like being consumed headfirst by a gigantic wolf like this guy. That's just another thing I don't tell you about in the brochures. Six months of the finest training in the galaxy most likely won't stop you from being turned into wolf shit. On a routine inspection of Simon 1, an Imperial Weapons Manufacturing Depot located in the Corellian Sector, Darth Vader is ambushed by several rebels, including the Wookiee Chewbacca. The large alien was usually armed with a long-range bowcaster and was an excellent marksman. Seeing his opportunity, the Wookiee takes his shot, or actually several shots. Vader doesn't waste a moment, and he lifts two of the stormtroopers into the air, blocking every incoming round. Each individual is hit by dozens of shots. I can only imagine the fear and betrayal they must have felt as rounds continue to pound into their body in quick succession. So there you have it guys, 10 extremely horrible deaths that stormtroopers suffered. This is a warning for all of you guys out there. Being a stormtrooper is like 95% boredom, unnecessary disciplinary actions from your commanding officers who don't like you, and then like 5% of sheer terror that you most likely are not prepared for. So don't enlist. I hope you guys enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. 
As usual, my name is Alan, and my allegiance is to the Republic, to democracy.